Kia ora te iwi. Uh, we're just waiting for the majority of our coaches, referees, managers, and others to make it onto the webinar. And then our New Zealand Rugby Comms people will let us know in a minute or two when we can start. So get comfortable, uh, get relaxed, um, and we'll make a start very shortly. Um, perhaps in the interim, while, you're, while we're waiting for everybody to log on, let us know in the chat function at the bottom of your screen um, who you might be coaching or what area you're refereeing in. Give a shout out to your school, your club, your provincial union. Let us know who's on the line with us tonight and we'll make a start very shortly. Also an opportunity for you to have a think about what questions you might ask because there'll be opportunities to ask questions to our panelists this evening. I can see people logging in, which is great. North Otago, great to have you with us, Wayne. Central Hawke's Bay, Logan, good to have you here as well. North Harbour, where Brendan Pickrell began his refereeing career. Great to have you here with us. Rolleston under 14s out in Ellesmere. Great to have you here with us as well. Right up from the far north. Lisa, Tokamaru Bay, I was there last week and had two power pies. Lots of people logging on from our referee associations, which is great to see. And we've been given the uh, the all clear, so we're good to go. Kia ora tato, no mai, hare mai. Uh, call Wayne Masters, Toko Ingwa. Uh, I'm Wayne from New Zealand Rugby. Uh, and welcome to the second of our Community Rugby webinar series. Tonight, it's all about rugby law. Yep, that's right. This evening, we'll be hearing from three experts. Uh, and we'll be focusing firstly on the global law trials and then the ED um, SLVs or experimental domestic safety law variations that we're playing under here in New Zealand for 2022. Um, hey, like any effective rugby training session, we begin with sharing what tonight's schedule will look like. So we'll be together for up to 60 minutes um, and we'll get to hear from and pick the brains of our three, ex of our three experts. Um, so please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, and... Uh, print in or write in, type in your questions and we'll endeavour to answer those live um, or one of the panel or our support staff will answer you directly um, in that Q&A function. Kapai. Um, tonight's panel, we've got a late substitution. Um, Paul Williams was meant to be joining us this evening, um, but he got injured in the warm-up. Um, so we're really grateful to have Mike Fraser uh, with us. Um, Mike has been with the New Zealand Rugby Ref panel um, since 2007. Um, made his international debut, and Mike can tell me if I'm wrong, um, in 2013. Um, can you remember, Mike, what uh, what two teams that was with, the major test debut? Uh, I certainly can, Wayne. It was um, Georgia and USA in uh, Tbilisi. Never heard right. of it before until uh, till I got there, but a great place. <laughs> <laughs> Georgia versus USA in 2013. But just importantly, as Mike's um, professional rugby co uh, refereeing career, he's also a coach. Um, with one of our junior teams at the Johnsonville Rugby Club here in Wellington. So he's doing his bit um, in keeping rugby at the heart of our communities. Um, great to have you with us this evening, Mike. Um, another familiar face we have with us this evening um, is Brendan Pickrell. Um, he's a man of letters in civil engineering and commerce, um, worked in the construction trade um, from, from deep in, in rugby country, in the red and black country in, in Canterbury out of UC. Um, been refing in the super and test space for a number of years now. Um, also was a keen player and supporter of rugby. Um, and as I said before, got into refereeing up in North Harbour. Um, welcome, Brendan. Thanks, Wayne. Thank you very much. Um, the University of Auckland there, Wayne. I can't uh, give the key oh, tabs um, any credit. Yeah. <laughs> never, never trust uh, Wikipedia. Um, um, also uh, they change that. That's the thing, Wayne. When you when you um, get Canterbury up, people go on your Wikipedia <laughs> and say that you're from Canterbury. So that's how that happens. <laughs> yes, very true, very true. Hey, also on tonight's uh, we have we have our very own New Zealand Rugby's very own Matt Peters. He's our game development manager, leading our referee development space. He's perfectly positioned to be with us um, this evening because his role crosses the community and the high performance space, well known because of his previous ref roles, particularly in the Central North Island region, 
had a stellar riffing and playing career. And he's based somewhere where he tells me it's beautiful one day, perfect the next. Tenakwe, Matt, tell us where you're beaming in from tonight. <laughs> well, from, from a very beautiful Palmerston North. <laughs> There you go. Hey, great. Well, let's kick on with things. Uh, remember, remember, Fano, use your use or um, well, type in your questions using the Q and A function at the bottom of your screen. Without further to do from me, I'm going to hand over um, to Mac. Kia ora, Wayne. Kia ora to Fano. Welcome on board, and it's really really cool to have everyone here and involved. So yeah, keep, keep those questions coming in, and we'll address them as we go. Um, and also a special welcome from me to, to BP and, and Mike uh, for being here. They're two incredibly busy people at the moment, heavily involved in Super Rugby at the moment, week in, week out. So uh, to have um, BP and Mike here with us uh, is really, really sensational. So um, we're going to look at the global law trials now. Everybody would have had an opportunity to, to see those um, in terms of just the pure law. Um, you've probably done some development around it. Uh, in your meetings or your development or your coaching courses, referee courses, etc. Um, but what I thought would be really good with this one is uh, actually get Brennan and and Mike to talk about the application of them and, and what it's been like. Uh, so they've been with these laws for a couple of years now and um, we've now adopted them um, for, from World Rugby into our community game for the first time in 2022. So um, they'll be able to share some really interesting insights into the application of the laws and what, what it means for them and some of the things to be aware of um, around the application of the laws. So we're going to keep it a little bit organic -y. Um Mike and Brendan might just sort of have a bit of co-discussion around some of the things as it evolves and um, we'll, um, we'll, we'll hopefully have some really good stuff come out as, as, as the discussion works on. So we'll start out um, and we'll take each law by um, individually. So we'll start with the, the 5022, uh, which people have been watching now for a couple of years. And so firstly, um, perhaps if I start with you, Brendan, um, if you could just tell everyone what, what the real purpose of the 5022 uh, law trial is. Yeah, thanks, uh, Nada. Um, yeah, so the 5022 was brought in because um, they wanted teams, defensive teams, to have to protect the backfield a little bit more. Um, the idea was that um, if the 5222 rule exists and the attacking team can kick it from within their own 50, bounce it out and get it out in the 22, that they'll get the attacking line out. So it meant that the defensive team will potentially have to hold that winger um, back to protect that kick. Um, which would then op open up space on the edge. So the rationale was that the law coming into place would mean that we'd have more space on the edge that the um, attacking team could potentially play to. So it just offered a, a sort of secondary attacking option to the attack. They can either kick to that space for the corner if the wing is up, or they can play wide and have that one-man overlap on the edge if, um, if the wing is actually back protecting the 50-22. Um, yes, yeah, so that was the intent, Nutter. Um, so, Mike, um, so having, having heard that and, and you're applying it, so do you think that has worked in, in practice? So do you think it has created that more space, taken, taken a defender out of the line, kept, kept him or her back? Yeah, I think we're starting to see a little bit of it. I, I think early on sides weren't quite sure how to use it and use it to their advantage. But I think as the competition's gone on or we've had more exposure to it, sides and coaches are getting used to it a bit more. I think we're seeing it attempted um, a bit more and, and obviously it is a massive play. If you, if you can kick from inside your 52 and get that attacking line out inside the 22, that's a massive attacking advantage. So um, we are certainly seeing a bit more of it now. And, and yeah, like, like Brendan said, trying to open up the space on the edges for attacking play as well, because that's, that's obviously what we want to see in our game. Cool. Um, so obviously, uh, co coaches have been playing an important part in this and, and getting their teams, you know, work, working it. So obviously, if they haven't got the ball, making sure they cover that cover that space, and those teams that have got the ball. Um, so there. So if we've got coaches on the call, um, you know, really really working this law and and taking the opportunity where you can. Um, so the, the next thing I guess is actually refereeing it. So. Um, Obviously, it's got to come from inside a team's half. Um, what what are the what are several things that referees really need to be aware of 
um, when it's, it is potentially on so that they get the decision right, whether it is a 50-22 or not. Is it through your experience with the Super Rugby, what are some of the things, if you, you know, give us two or three tips that if, if, if we could just upload them and have them in our back pocket um, so that we, we we got greater awareness around the referee of it? Yeah, yeah. I think there's um, like there's two key parts to it. Obviously, where the ball's kicked from. Um, so whether it was inside the fifty or outside, and I think that one actually, we haven't had too much trouble with that. Like you, you can pretty much see it as the referee as you sense that it's going towards the twenty-two. You know, it's happened soon enough that you can sort of look back or you already know where it's kicked from. Um, so that's the first thing you got to judge is actually where it's kicked from. But the second component, um, and just I'm sure you agree, Mike, is, is the part that we actually got challenged with a little bit was um, whether or not the ball has been carried back into the 22. So we had a couple of situations early on where we definitely knew that it was kicked from in the 22, uh, from in the 50, sorry, went out in the 22. But there was some confusion as to whether there had been a ruck in the um, defensive half that was then passed back. So it was that whether it was carried back into the 50 or not was the part of the, um, the equation, if you will, that um, we had to work through and sort of train ourselves to get better at. So um, would you agree with, yeah, with that? I, I think the key, yeah, I think that it's, it's just um, like any new law or anything that comes new into the game, it um, just takes a while to get used to. And I think like the 22, you know, that's pretty obviously common practice for us referees now. We, we know when it's carried back or whether they're inside and, and obviously the applicable law from there. So I think just we, we actually saw some guys, and they're still doing it now, where they're verbalising um, whether it's gone or carried back um, across the 50 or not. So whether you verbalise it or whether you just mentally say that to yourself in your head is, is I've found quite useful as well, just to know where it's originated from. Yeah, totally agree. So basically, as the referees, you probably already do in your games in the weekend. When you're around about that 22 area, you're sort of telling yourself mentally, carried back into the 22. You really have to train yourself to get into that same habit around the halfway line as well. So, I mean, it's a great tip. So all our referees here, and it, it might be, for example, in a pre-match, you know, the coaches on the call, perhaps get your, your, your captain to sort of, have that conversation with the referee and say, you know, will you communicate if the ball's much like you do around the 22? Uh, for the 50-22, um, can, can we expect some communication? Now, while whilst it's not mandatory, it might be a good good practice so that, it, you know, the players are in the loop, the referee's in the loop, and it's a very conscious process. We sometimes get the um, captains also, I mean, or tens also asking us, you know, there might be a scrum or a line out on or about the uh, the 50 metre line. The cap, uh, the 10 will actually be saying to the ref, ref is this inside? Um, because they actually want that option of kicking the 50-22. So um, pretty important to know when those scrums and line outs are set, whether they're inside or outside of the 50 metres. Um, and another sort of anomaly one that came up was... Um, the ball kicked out on the full from a kickoff. Now you've got a scrum in the middle of the halfway. So there was some sort of teams were wondering, well, is that inside the 50 or is it not inside the 50 because it's right on the line? Um, and the way we discussed it uh, uh, was that we would call that inside the 50. So we think you can kick a 50-22 from a, a midfield scrum. Great. So that, I mean, that's a really good insight. That so, um, you know, we, we need to we need to promulgate that. That's that's a good bit of intel. Um, that's that's really good, guys. And and so if, if we just sort of bring that global law trial to to a summary piece, um, overall impact on the game. Do you think it's for your own sense, to, from a refereeing perspective, a playing perspective? Do you think it's hitting the mark? Oh look. For me, I think it's still early on. Like I said before, I think um, sides are still getting used to it. Um, I'm not sure how much we're seeing filtered through um, club rugby, whether it's something um, sides are deliberately doing. I did watch a game of um, Premier Footy here in Wellington the other day, and I did see one. Um, so it is it is happening, and yeah, players will generally tell you whether they've whether they've got one because they're pretty excited when they pull it off. But look, I think it's a good thing, and um, yeah, it's a, another exciting addition for the game. Cool. So what, what we're hearing, guys, if we can just bring that to a, to a conclusion, um, just in terms of action, referees make it a conscious process. Um, 
verbalize it. And um, so then you're also, you're in the know, but equally the players are in the know as well. And um, they can kick from there, kick on from there. We'll just pause there and um, Wayne may have some, some questions for us before we move on. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, man. And, and really enjoying your talk about the impact or the opportunities there are within the coaching space um, for these global law trials. We've got a question here, and it's probably a little bit ahead of time, perhaps, but I'll put it, I'll put it out there anyway. Um, which of the global law trials are having the most negative effects on the game? Well, that's one to get us uh, maybe controversial, but which of the which of the global law trials are having the most negative effects on the game? Actually, I don't know if that's a great one to start with, but anyway, that's come through. What do we think? Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, I'm personally, I'm actually in favour of all these global law trials. As we go through them um, tonight, you'll see that some of them haven't actually really changed, or they've, they've certainly changed, um, the coaching's changed, but as far as refereeing it, you haven't really seen any change. So um We'll get to that in a second, but we're certainly seeing a change with the 50-22. I think the goal line dropout, we're certainly seeing a different change in the game. Um, as far as negative change, I, I don't know. It's up to each person to determine if they think it's a negative or a positive. Like um, I had a situation in the weekend in the um, Crusaders versus Brumbies game where the Crusaders were um, attacking. They got very close to the line, but got held up just over the goal line. Um, so they've, they've worked their way up to the goal line. Um, in the past, that would have been a five-meter scrum, but now they have to receive a goal line dropout. So that's actually an easier exit for the Brumbies. Um, so I'm not saying that's positive or negative, but it's just a difference. That's probably, um, in the past, the attack would have had a five-meter scrum, which is potentially more advantageous than receiving a goal line dropout. So um, that's probably how I'd answer that one, Wayne. Thanks. Thank you, Brendan. Um, there's a couple of others coming through, but I think just for now, um, Matt, we might just carry on. Yeah. Um, and then we'll come back to a couple of those questions later on. But thanks for the opportunity for our listeners. Cool. Thanks, Wayne. Um, right, guys, we'll, we'll kick on to the goal line dropout. Um, another really interesting one. And um, so we'll just go through the same sort of format. So perhaps, Mike, if I, I start with you, if, if you can just sort of outline for our, our viewers um, what the purpose of, of that particular law is, and then we'll get into sort of some of the application things. Yeah, I, I guess the purpose with this one, the goal line dropout, was really to um, ultimately minimise the number of five-metre scrum situations we have, which, as we know in the past, um, can drag on a bit, and we tend to get a few of them. So this was just about, um, I guess, ultimately creating more ball and play time where we get... Um, Rather than setting a five meter scrum from these situations, we then get a goal line dropout and balls back in play um, a hell of a lot quicker than than a scrum sequence. So that's really what it's about. But there's been a, flow, a few flow on impacts around some exciting footy that's been played as a result. So it's a good one. Yeah, great. Thanks, Mike. So I actually want to get onto that next. Um, so just as an observer of it, one of the things I think we are seeing from the goal line dropout is some really significant counter or attack opportunities. Um, perhaps you can just talk, talk us through how you see that as a referee and, and the impact that that's actually having on the game. Yeah, well, I think sides are um, reluctant now that, that they're giving it a second thought where they actually, you know, the, the scenario where the ball's kicked through into a goal by the attacking side. In the past, you just simply see them force it and, and run out to the 22. But um, now what we're seeing is they're actually going, well, do I um, actually want to just run that ball out? Um, and then we're seeing some pretty exciting play because of that, that maintaining position of the ball, running it out from their own goal line and, and, and maintaining position. So um, rather than having to force the goal line drop out and just turning that, that ball over. So yeah, there's, there's been a few examples early on where the ball's gone in there. We're expecting um, them to ground the ball for the goal line drop out. And next minute they're off passing the ball wide and running downfield. So yeah, I, it, we've had some great rugby as a result. Yeah. Okay, so BP, let's say they do do the, the goal on dropout. Again, um, very often what we're seeing is the, the team that's receiving that ball, whether it be 40 metres out, 50 metres out, again, attacking back. Um, so if we look at the purpose of it that, that Mike's just described, you'd, you'd probably say um, that's really, really come to the fore. Uh, any, any observations there? 
I mean, it's just that counterattack situation, which is um, obviously dangerous, you know, whether it's from a kick in general play and a team decides to counter, or in this case, it's from a goal line dropout, that counterattack, um, that's when you get some of the exciting rugby. So, yeah, the goal line dropout, once you've had it, um, well, they're going to catch it on about the 40, probably run up as far as the 22, and we're straight into some attacking rugby again. So, um, yeah, that's a mindset you've got to be in as a referee. You've got to, as soon as the goal line drop and dropout happens you can't switch off because um it's the idea was that um and i think the stats might have shown early on that often there was a try from that first phase or, or two or three um phases later um which was the intent of of that um goal line dropout so i mean that's that's some really cool positive messaging around that that law and you'd have to say if you go back to how you describe the intent of it you'd probably say it's working um, so what does that mean for our coaches uh, that are out there watching? Um, you know, so uh, if, if you're the team that's kicking, what does that mean in terms of how you frame up a defensive system? Equally, that team that's receiving that ball, what, is, what does it mean for your team in terms of a, an attacking opportunity, um, which brings a different shape to our game than what we've seen from, as you say, five-meter scrum. So there's some really, really cool coaching opportunities there, I would have thought. Um, are, you, are you seeing different teams doing different things with goal line dropouts as a result of that, that coaching piece of work? I think um, most of the time, um, the teams, uh, the team taking the goal line dropout seems to take their time um, because they want to kick it long and then have a really well organized um, chase line. Um, because if they're, you know, if they're going up and they're not all connected, um, they're at massive risk of being. Um, run through on the counter-attack so um most of the time they seem to be taking a while but again in the weekend i saw something different where the chiefs player took a quick goal line dropout which was the first one i'd had in any of my games and i thought that was quite risky because the goal line dropout has to actually travel five meters it's not like in the past where the 22 meter dropout it can just go over the line so the goal line dropout has to go the five meters but um he managed to pull it off he, he did the quick goal line dropout, regathered the ball, they set a ruck, and then they cleared from there. But um, so that's um, yeah, two different ways that I've seen it done. Um, but um, yeah, I guess there's no right way. But um, yeah. Hey, Matt, I, I, I just, Matt, I was just going to share um, an insight in terms of the refereeing piece. Um, in terms of practically refereeing this, one one thing I found with this and. And when you look at the law, the, the trial, the wording around it, there's actually quite a few words. And I think, and I certainly didn't, a lot of people are getting confused by the, the sort of scenarios and what they are and what is and what isn't included. For me, the way I simplified it right down is there, there's three ways we can get that goal line dropout and, and we know what those are. And if it's not one of those, um, it's what it's always been in the past. And that really, when, when I summed it up and sort of thought about it that way, that made it a whole lot easier in my mind. So... If you get the situation where uh, the attacking player goes in to score a try, but he's bundled into a touch and goal before he grounds it, and there's often some confusion, is that a goal line dropout or not? Well, it's not one of the three ways we can get a goal line dropout, so then it reverts back to what it's always been. That's that's a 22, always has been and, and still is. So that's a, a little tip there, I reckon, for um, practically refereeing this one. That, that's really cool, Mike, and that, that was going to be my next question, so you've preempted it, and I think that's really important um, for our referees to, to really have a summarised version, you know, in their mind about, you know, because it can happen pretty quickly, and equally it's a situation where there can be a bit of traffic, you know, some desperate defence, some desperate attack on that line, and then around that corner post, so really being clear on more, um, and so that's a really good way to, to, to strip it back. Um, so, so what we're hearing is for the referees, you have a really conscious process, understand the law, uh, but remembering also that 22s are still there to, to take for when it doesn't apply, uh, and equally so are five metre scrums uh, when, it, when it doesn't apply. Um, so uh, stay, stay, you know, I, I guess for, for our referees, it's really important we, we, we visit it, we revisit it, and we keep clarifying it. And and I know for you guys, BP and Mike, there are times there where go, you're, you're pretty grateful to have a TMO, aren't you? So our community referees don't have that luxury. So the, the, the higher alert we can be, that was another message you talked about. And around that high alert, um, know the law and we should be in a good place. 
Uh, the other thing that we've, we've heard is some examples of those coaching opportunities. So the coaches are online. Uh, there could be some really cool things. So having that quick kick up your sleeve, for example, when the team that's on attack aren't necessarily ready and you just go and, and suddenly you get some gain from the from, from your own defensive end. The other one, Nutter, that gets discussed a bit um, for the receiving team on a goal line dropout is always asked, um, can they take a drop kick at goal? Which we've actually seen a few times where the um, – not, I don't know if we've seen it in New Zealand. Maybe Geordie Barrett might have tried one, but um, I think up north um, or in certain competitions when they had it, they actually, a team has dropped a goal from the um, goal, receiving a goal line dropout, which is completely legal. So um, that's another option um, if you've got a good kicker. Great. All those coaches out there, you've got a good drop kicker. Uh, it, 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 it might be might be just what you need on any given day. So great insight, BP. Um, so if we just summarise that, if we had to say successful or not successful, how are we feeling? I think it's a good, interesting new addition. Um, I don't know what the stats will say around ball and play or tries from goal line dropouts or any of that, so I can't speak to that. But um, it, it's probably been the hardest one, like Mike said. It requires the ref to do a lot more thinking. So from around that in goal area, you're processing a lot. Like, is this a goal line dropout? Is it a five meter scrum? Is it a 22 meter dropout? There's a lot of different scenarios that can happen. So um, this has been the one for me that I've had to think the most about. And um, so, um, yeah, probably not a good thing from a referee perspective, but, um, but something we certainly need to work on as refs to make sure we get it right. Cool. Any further thoughts, Fraser? No, no, I think um, Brendan summed it up well. Cool. Thanks, guys. So, yeah, plenty to get our teeth into there and, and a really positive part of our game at the moment. Wayne, over to you. Hey, thank you, Matthew. Uh, lots of um, discussion in the chat function around where these laws apply. Um, so, good. Um, there's good information on this on rugbytoolbox.co.nz where you can see the different um, domestic law variations and the EDSLVs to what grades they apply uh, in New Zealand. And it does vary with the EDSLVs, does vary, which we'll talk about later this evening, does vary from provincial union to provincial union. Um, but do check out with your provincial union um, and also go on rugbytoolbox.co.nz to see what age grades or what grades the particular laws apply. Um, just one, well, lots of questions coming through, which we're, which we're trying to work our way through. Um, is there a time frame on how quick the dropout must be taken? I was under the impression it was to be immediate. That's from Kerry. Anyone I think it does. Know? Yeah, I think immediate, immediate in the nature of, um, I don't think they have to grab the ball and kick it straight away. I think probably without undue delay would be a, a, a practical application of that immediate um, requirement. Um, I think they can wait for their players to get back and get set and be on side. I don't think we need to be pressuring tens to be booting it straight away while players are still retreating. So, um, But again, in the weekend, I had a team that was too slow to take it, and so I told them to hurry it up. So a common, a common sense approach. Hey, thank you, Brendan. Um, and just here's a quick one to answer from many of our three panellists that say, um, it's a yes or no question, I think. Just to be clear, can you drop a goal from a, a goal line dropout? There, is there a need to have a phase? Yes, you can drop kick a goal straight from the goal line dropout. Thank you, Brendan. I think we'll um, go to you, Matt. Great. Thanks, Wayne. And um, yes, a really, really, really uh, great a global law trial there for all of us to get get in and really enjoy and you coaches uh get your get your thinking caps on and, and think about some ways you can utilize that um that law to your to your best ability given the cattle that you've got in your, in your squads the next one we'll talk about is the flying wedge and it probably won't take too long and and um brendan and mike will will share why um but but First, I'll get uh, Brendan, if you can just describe what that flying wedge looks like or in, in practice, and then uh, we'll hand it over and say, okay, so what does it now look like in our game, if at all, uh, we, we, that, whether we've seen it or not? So over to you, Brendan. Yeah, so the flying wedge, um, or as another way you could call it, is a two-man latch. So it's where the ball carrier has two or more players um, bound to him um, pre-contact. So um, 
the rationale was that that's actually very dangerous for a defender to try and tackle a ball carrier who's got two players bound alongside him. Um, the balance of power there is clearly with the attack. He's got players with them. So um, you, you can't do it. So they've outlawed it. So you can have one man um, bound on to the ball carrier, but as soon as you've got two or more, that's illegal. Okay, so we've got a picture of what it looks like. Um, Mike, have, have, you, have we seen much or any evidence of the flying wedge um, being practised in Super Rugby? Um, and, and if so, what, what does it sort of mean uh, in terms of how we deal with it? Yeah, I, to be honest, I haven't seen it. Um, it's not to say it hasn't happened, but um, this, this one's pretty closely linked to the, the, the pre-latch, the single pre-latch we'll talk about shortly, where... This one really happens close to the goal line in those pick and drive situations, I think. So it's going to be slow ball off, off the back of a ruck where you potentially may see it. Um, the only other scenario I can think of, and, and like I say, I haven't seen it, is from a, a quick tap or a tap situation, a tap penalty. They, uh, the, the old school situation where they set up a bit of a flying wedge type scenario, but I'm not seeing that in the professional game. And I don't think we've seen too much of it at community rugby as well. So. Um, yeah, this one is is not really effective for us at the moment. But if we are seeing it, or if it is happening, it is it is close to the goal line. That we we just got to have that heightened awareness. Yeah, I think uh, to be fair, it was something that became quite prevalent up in the northern hemisphere. Um, can I just a point of clarification? If you've got a, a mall that comes to a standstill um, and a ball carrier is there, and they break away with two people attached, does that still constitute that flying wedge, or is that a breakaway? A, a genuine breakaway from a mall, um, as opposed to standing wide of a phase, a ball carrier standing, say, five metres away, getting the ball and, and running with, with the two people attached. Perhaps if you can clarify that for us. I think if it was uh, a, a legal mall set up um, and then that's driving and then pay, players have fallen away, so we're calling that the same mall, um, I, I don't think that's a flying wedge. I think that's just the same mall. Um, so, and... We, we could go, we could talk for another 10 minutes about um, same mall versus obstruction and, yeah. you know, is it a change of lane, which is an obstruction or is it same mall or whatever. But I think in principle, um, if you had a legal mall set up to begin with um, and then you sort of end up in this flying wedge situation, I don't think that's what this, the intent of this law was to bring out. I think like Mike said, primarily it's when players are setting up um, off the nine or off the 10 with a, a two man latch to them um, to then drive into contact. That's the, that's the action that we want to be eliminating. Cool. Uh, yeah, thanks for that, uh, Brendan. And uh, Brendan, it's, it's good clarity. So, you know, for our coaches out there, um, you know, the referees, if they see it, um, they're now being asked to action, uh, uh, sanction, sanction it. So, what does that mean for us as coaches? Um, thinking of other ways we can attack in a legal formation as opposed to having that, that pre-latch with, with two people and driving into the defence there. So um, part of it's safety. Well, it's mainly because of safety. The other part is it, it genuinely uh, eliminates contestability, if you think about it. So we don't want to see it in our game. And fortunately, um, certainly our super coaches, it appears that they've, they've got this on board. They're not coaching it. So they're thinking of other ways to take the defensive line on, fair to say? Yeah, 100%. Um, they're definitely not coaching a pre-latch anymore. So um, that support player or, you know, the first attacking player who's going to potentially be the first cleaner at the at the ruck, um, he, if, if the player stays up in the contact and the tackle, he's, he's latching post the contact. So nobody is coaching to um, pre-latch anymore. Okay, so that takes us to that next global law trial, um, the latch. And as you say, it's fairly similar to the flying wedge, but it, it's it's the ball carrier and one person uh, attached. We so perhaps Mike. Um, so BP has indicated that it's it's not being coached. However, we know we can get some reversion uh, in in practice on the field. Are uh, we still seeing a bit of a hangover of of the pre latch? And if so, where is it likely to occur? And, and what does it mean for our referees in terms of being alert around it? Yeah, I think we are we, we are seeing a little bit of this. And, and, and uh, like I said before, it's definitely happening. Um, that pick and go 
either attacking the, the goal line or also we have seen a little bit of it when um, sides are uh, sort of setting up an exit play out of their own um, 22 as well, where it's pick and go to set up a, an exit kick. But I think the key with this one is um, being pre-latched or one person pre-latching to the ball carrier is not illegal. It becomes illegal when they go off feet. So that that's um, quite an important difference. And if, if you see, and again, it's the awareness piece, if you see a player pre-latching, you need to have your awareness heightened. And then if they go anywhere near off feet in that contact, then that's when um, they need to be penalised. So we are still seeing quite a few examples where they pre-latch, but they are doing well to stay on their feet um, and drive through that contact, which is still legal and okay. It's the going off feet post-contact that is um, that they're trying to stop here. Yeah. Uh, great insight, Mike. And and um, we, we are definitely seeing that. You're right. Um, if there was a high alert area, um, you know, where referees need to be on alert, where players can potentially revert, even though even, even though coaching, they mightn't be getting coached. You know, what, what is it? Where is that area? Uh, like I say, I just think that's attack right on the goal line there um, for mine. Um, yeah, I think I sort of summarised that before. Okay. I, I don't think there's, yeah, that, that's sort of the main area I think we're seeing it, Matt, in terms of, um, yeah, yeah, it's when they're setting up that slow ruck ball, they're pick and go close to the line. Um, those are the ones, you know, I, I can recall a couple on review in my games where you go, yeah, I think, geez, I've just missed that. And like like all of us, this is new to us as well, this, this pre-lapse. So increase awareness around close to the goal line and then if, and then if they're getting that secondary part where they're going off feet, then, then that's a penalisable offence. So BP, given that situation... If you've, if you've got, you can see a team, you know, they're five metres out from a goal line, they're hard on attack, and you, and you, and you see them already um, setting up to have a pre-latch. Is there, is there any, any way to remember at the community level, um, you know, they, your communication, you're sort of stripping your communication back a little bit at your level. Do you think it would be a good proactive stance for community referees to potentially say, stay up, um, as, as, that, as that one, those two people get the ball and, and drive forward? Yeah, definitely. Um, like you say, I think we're lucky in the professional level, the players are trained around this and so they're pretty good. But I can imagine in community rugby, especially as we're going through this um, this new change phase that, um, yeah, there will be a bit of it. And um, it's uncomfortable to give that penalty just out from the goal line against the attack. But, um, but if it's there, we have to give it. So I think being proactive and um, sort of saying stay up here, um, it is perfect and we often see that actually or we have seen that in the past referees do that at the end of games when teams are trying to kill the game because they're up by one point in the 81st minute or oh, well, in the 79th minute of the game and they're trying to kill a minute on the clock referees get quite proactive in that space because the attacking team's either going to seal off or the latch is going to go straight off his feet there so um I, I think your same rationale about using that management and that scenario as it gets near the goal line is a, is a really good one because if you can manage the players to stay up and then we get a great try well that's a good outcome so what we're hearing is um there's some ways that referees can contribute to the management of it to avoid it so mitigate the opportunity to have to, have to sanction uh equally for our coaches um there's some really cool coaching opportunities uh when coaching taking ball into contact and what that can look like and um, so uh, Brennan and, and Mike have alluded to the fact that taking the ball in contact and that latcher stays up and drives through um, so then they can they can take out any threats there um, and the ball is available to be contested if, if possible otherwise it's perfectly legal um, and then it also potentially allows the, the opposition team to come in and have their shot at the ball as well right um, Whereas before, and that's the main reason this law came in, correct me if I'm wrong, is to actually retain an element of con uh, contestability at that tackle phase. Otherwise, the latcher just goes down on the ball carrier and that's contest over. So, so really cool opportunities for referees. Some great opportunities to coach in for our coaches um, to keep the ball alive and keep the game going. We'll just pause there, Wayne, any questions? Yeah, thank you, Matt. Yeah, the questions are coming through quick and fast. 
Um, and we're doing our best to answer them, uh, Fano, through the chat, um, sorry, through the Q&A or through the panel. Um, is it off the feet? If off feet when a try is scored, is it a try? Yeah, if it's in goal, you can be off your feet. Can be off your feet. Yeah, so if a pre latch goes through into a goal and they score the try, then yeah, try is good. Good question. Uh, hey, look, uh, really appreciate uh, Mike and Brendan um, for being with us this evening and and putting yourselves in front of coaches and other referees within our within our community. We've all got skin in the game, um, and so it's great opportunity. Great to see that we're we're sort of all in this together um, and I really appreciate your uh, your candidness with things. We've got callers, we've got people on the webinar from the UAE, from Cyprus, from Massachusetts, from Sweden and from Melbourne. So great that we've got so many people from outside of the country as well. I think that's it for the Q&A at the moment. Um, so um, back to you, Mo uh, sorry, back to you, Matt. Thanks, Wayne. Um, well, we keep going, right? We've got one more global law trial to address and that's um, the targeting, targeting of the lower limbs at the ruck uh, during the, the clear out. Um, so really what we're talking about is usually we're talking about the jackler. Uh, so a player of the, of the non-ball carrying team coming in to try and contest the ball and then a player coming in and then trying to move or remove that, that jackler. And this, this global law trial is fundamentally um, there for safety reasons. So, uh, Mike, perhaps if you can just sort of outline what that one looks like in, in terms of the law and, and what it should look like in, in practice. Yeah, well, I think you've summed it up well there, Matt, in terms of the safety piece is, um, is key here, where, um, you know, I think if you think about those jacklers going in to try and secure that um, turnover ball, they're in a pretty vulnerable position. So we want to make sure, um, I, I guess, like we're, we're expecting defensive players to do, we want to see them coming through the gate, entering that ruck, um, through, from a legal position. Um, and what we don't want to see, especially from the attack, is when, they, when there's a jackler there going in to win that turnover, we don't want to see them um, targeting those lower limbs because, as I say, they're in a really vulnerable position and, and hitting those um, lower limbs, hips and down, um, you know, that doesn't end well. So as referees, we're trying to be better at, I, I guess, identifying the side entry from the attack in their cleans, and especially when they're... Um, when they're targeting those lower limbs. BP, last year we saw, um, not many, but we saw several incidents of, of this. Um, uh, from, from your experience in Super Rugby this year, do you think that, um, that the coaches have, have taken this on board and seen it for what it is in terms of keeping everyone safe and, and therefore we've seen a positive outcome as a result of the, the application of it? Yeah, I think so. I, I don't think this was like commonplace um, previously, but I do think when it happened, it was extremely dangerous. Mm -hmm. So um, like Mike said, I liked Mike's point there, which was often these are actually picked up as side entries anyway, um, because the player, if, if the attacking player is getting right uh, onto the jackler's legs, well, there's a good chance that he's actually entered in the side to do that. So there's enough... Um, of an um, incentive not to do it, to be penalised for side entry. And then equally, if it's actually a dangerous action, diving down into the legs or or rolling the guy and twisting his leg, um, then it'll be a penalty for dangerous play anyway. So I think there's enough incentive there for coaches not to be um, targeting the legs. You know, they're going to have to get up under the shoulders, load a high and, and drive the player out from at the front. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, some, so from a purely observational point of view, where we had a few, and it was minimal last year, but we did have some this year. I don't think we've seen really. We, I don't think we've seen any, have we? I haven't seen a penalty for this in Super Rugby myself, Mike. But I don't know if you can recall seeing one. Um, but um, but I, I think it's just to, to me that this just gives the referee every right if if he sees a really dangerous action where the player who's in the jackal position is getting his leg twisted through an action of an attacker, you've got every right and you should be penalising it because, um, you know, jackling for the ball is dangerous enough as it is with people flying in at you and um, we we can't be letting players, um, you know, tearing um, their, their um, ACL or, um, you know, getting serious knee injuries. Um, yeah. So, I mean, there's some really important messaging there for our community coaches that are on the call 
Um, it appears obviously our super coaches, you know, they're in a, they're in a place where they're paid to try and get wins. Um, community rugby is is about participation, and and there's different thoughts around getting that W at different levels in, in community rugby. But for all our coaches listening, um, you know, if there's one thing if we can walk away from this, say, look, let's keep all our players with our own or our opposition safe around this, and and often these injuries, as Brendan has just alluded, are particularly serious. Um, so again, what's the coaching point? How do we move jacklers without having to target legs unnecessarily? And so there's some great opportunity there um, around what we can do with our teams as coaches uh, in order to move jacklers uh, in a really safe way, um, which is why that law has been brought in to try and you know protect our jacklers. Um, so some cool opportunity there. Wayne, any questions? Yeah, we've got a question here relating to what you've just been discussing, team. So what can you target if not the legs? I think you can get um, under the shoulders and drive up. I think that um, it doesn't mean you can't touch the leg. Um, like you you might be grabbing the, around the body and one arm's up maybe around the thigh of the other guy. You know, we're not going silly and saying you can't touch his legs. But what you can't do is intentionally target sort of at the knee area, target just only target the leg, um, which is actually quite dangerous. So um, grabbing around the body, shoulder, armpit, um, that's all fine. Um, uh, yeah, but any incidental leg contact in a cleaner, no, we, we, we wouldn't be saying that that's um, covered under this law. Thanks, thanks, Brendan. And, and I'm going to go backwards a little bit to go forwards because our chat function is blowing up with <laughs> um, discussion around the goal line dropout. We uh, lots Lots of discussion here. So there's a few people discussing it. So I'm just going to go back if I can for a moment. This is from Warren and Ranfurly, um, and part of the discussion is goal line dropout, defending, and this, this will take a little bit for me to read this out, goal line dropout, defending team pass the ball back to the kicker in the field of play. The ball is kicked and then charged down by opponents. Ball heads into in goal and defenders dot the ball down. Does that become a goal line dropout, a scrum to the attackers, or are we heading to a 22 metre dropout? Sorry, lots of that question. Yeah. So I and I'll throw to Mike here um, as well. But um, this is where we got confused ourselves because the way it's written isn't entirely intuitive. So if I go to Mike, what's your principle, Mike? You, you just repeat your principle to how to decide if it's a goal line dropout. Yeah. So if it's not one of the three ways, so if it's not knocked on by um, attacking goal. If it's not held up in goal and it's not put into in goal by attack and grounded by defence, then it's what it's always been. So, but just an important one on that third one, Mike, but it's the third one, just so this, I think this is the clarity point that everyone needs to hear. The third point is that it's kicked into in goal by the attackers. So if it's kicked into in goal by the attackers and grounded by defence, that's a goal line dropout. Uh, this and one was scenario, charged down, charged down, but it was so, still put so, in in goal. No, but a charge down, as the law reads, is not a kick. So that's different. So as I said, this is where we've, our heads have been spinning as well. Intuitively, you would say that the attack putting it in there is a goal line dropout. But the, as the law reads, it says from an attacking kick, therefore, um, a charge down um, is, as it's always been, is still a 22. It's a bit of a mind... Well summed up. <laughs> Not, yeah, nice summary, Brendan. And just our old friend, uh, David Courtney Walsh, has just um, suggested that we give clarity um, to reiterate what the three ways the goal line dropout can occur. Yeah, so I think we just covered that then, maybe just as uh, while she was typing it. But uh, yeah, attacked, uh, attacking team knock on and in goal. Um, attacking team held up in goal or ball kicked into in goal and grounded by defence in in goal. And if it's not one of those three, then it's what it's always been. So, yeah, the charge down scenario is a good one and, and well picked up. And also, we're just David Walsh has just written a really good point in there, which is that there has been some correspondence with World Rugby, which is why these are trialled, because these concerns around does it make sense or not 
um, we've actually ridden back to world rugby. And so in the future, when this eventually does or doesn't come in, there may be some tweaks to some of this. So we just need to understand that we're in a trial period at the moment and we need to do what the law actually states right at the moment. And that may yet change. Awesome. Thanks, gents. Um, let's let's move on. Stand down, Walshy, and back to you, Matt Peters. Well, that's that's the global law trials, um, Wayne. So um, unless there's any other other questions or discussion points, um, we can let um, Mike and Brendan go. Um, so look, hopefully that's been really helpful for everybody. Um, and I've continually emphasised right through the coaching opportunities. So I mean, the important thing around these global law trials. Whilst where law sits there, laws for everyone. Laws not just for referees; it's there for players and coaches as well, and and therefore that should drive some of those opportunities that coaches need to be thinking about and how they can maximise, utilise um, these laws to their benefit, and also for the benefit of their players and the safety of their players. Um, so the more people that know know them and are familiar with them and, and can apply them either in a coaching sense or in a refereeing sense the better our game will be for it. And we're certainly seeing that in Super Rugby where the coaches have taken a really positive stance around the global law trials and have said, how can we maximise these to our benefit? And we've definitely seen some positive outcomes. So some really cool stuff there for, for everyone. Um, Mike, Brendan, any, any just last thoughts uh, signing off uh, that you'd like to add around the GLTs or we good to go? No, I think that was a good summary there, Matt. And um, yeah, I think... Uh, but like anything new, it takes a little while to get used to it. But um, take your time and and uh, enjoy enjoy your work out there. Yep. Likewise. Cheers, Nutter. Um, no, good session, and um, all the best to everyone as they uh, work through this. Awesome. Thank you, Brendan and Mike, and lots of lots of well wishes. Um, appreciating your time with us. Um, and wishing you the best for the rest of the season. And we really appreciate. Um, you being with us, both of you being with us this evening. Um, we'll stay with you though, Matt Peters, um, for a little bit. We've got some time to talk a little bit about the EDSLVs. Um, so I'll hand back to you, Matt, if there's any sort of main points you want to bring up. And we can also see if there's any questions around the experimental domestic law variations. Thanks, Wayne. Look, uh, we've, we've only got um, sort of about seven or eight minutes left. And um, really what I wanted to do was um, just offer an opportunity for anybody who would like to um, have, have uh, an opportunity to either comment on the EDSLVs or ask any questions about them. Um, at the moment, I'm travelling the country, going to every PU, catching up with various people. And one of the things that is becoming really evident, those people that have, that have actually got in, teased these apart, worked them, read them, discuss them they've got a, they've got a really sharp handle on them um, those that haven't sort of done due diligence around some follow-up from from game development presentations around them um, can be battling a little bit and in fact I'm fielding questions around these every day um, and um, some, some of them pr probably appear relatively basic and and it just might be that um, we, we've got to continue to revisit them. Um, so I'm just starting with that, and and I haven't got time to go through them all, and and that's not the point of this. But but I'm and and like and Wayne could be helped here too. We're happy to take any any sort of comments or questions around the EDSLVs. Over. Yeah. Thank thank you thank you Matt. I look, got one here from Nick. Um, given safety rules, I'm assuming means laws around tackle below the sternum. Um, how does that affect clean out at a breakdown? So um, it's a bit like the last global law trial uh, we talked about. So law, um, so go to law. So we're we're referencing tackle, right? So clean out is a very different um, part of the game than the tackle. It's the clean out is post tackle, so it it doesn't it doesn't apply. Okay, hey, thank you for that, Matt. Um, uh, a message to Kerry. Kerry, yes, um, this is being recorded and you will be able to access it on rugbytoolbox.co.nz. Um, another question. Well, perhaps while you're finding it, Wayne, I'll just, just one question that has been coming my way quite a bit from, from all around the country is 
if you end up with one of those scrums that um, has to be reset and therefore, uh, and there's no infringement, you're on a five minutes, you know, five minutes out or wherever it might be, um, and you've got the option of a free kick or, or a reset scrum uncontested, um, and, you're, and you're five metres out, um, oh, sorry, sorry, a five metre scrum, and the question is, is the attacking team can push five metres there, can the defensive team? And the answer is yes. So not an uncontested one. Um, it's it's equi, equal. Um, uh, it's an interesting question because uh, they are like chicken's teeth. <laughs> Scrums that get pushed five metres. In actual fact, that's another one that I've been talking to people around is often the reaction to the 1.5 metre push. Um, oh, gee, you know, the deep power. In actual fact, very rarely do you see a scrum getting pushed more than a metre and a half anyway. It'll often turn before it goes that distance. Right. So I think you'll find that that doesn't dampen down our scrums too much. I think you'll find you'll still have your contest um, and you'll still get good, solid front row play um, despite the EDSLVs. Right. And, of course, you can push more than five metres in a five-metre scrum. Sorry, more than 1.5 metres at a, in a five metre scrum, um, you can um, to still still attempt to push over try or likewise push the opposing scrum 95 metres down the other end of the field. Um, for below first 15, we're not with the not jumping to catch kicks. Does this apply to kickoffs or just kicks in general play? Kicks in general play. Uh, the rationale there is at kickoff. Um, we feel the safety is there because generally around receivers of kickoff, they've got um, support players there to, to help with um, that, that safety thing. So what we're trying in, in general play, often a receiver of a, a kick in general play is often on their own, mm -hmm. and therefore they don't have that, that um, <clears throat> fellow player support around them um, if they do get connected in the air. Right. Um, and in an in, in uncontested scrum, can the number eight carry? Yes, they can. Thank you. Uh, can you clarify the secondary tackler ruling? Often the second tackler is higher, uh, not illegal by old laws. Secondly, what happens in the if the attacker dips down? So we have to we have to rule that anyway. Um, the, the, and and but if there's two tacklers in in the in the tackle, the same law applies. If if you got one of those EDSLVs where the the base of the sternum is the high tackle line, mm -hmm. then the second tackler that's the high tackle line. Uh, and I go back to so you know, what are the coaching opportunities here? And coaches and players have to revisit um, how they go about doing their tackle practice and their training. Um, and again, the, you know. Don't think of it as a as a problem thing. Think of it as an opportunity to do things really different. Um, but that's there for a purpose. And whether there's one, two, or three tacklers in there, your high tackle line is the sternum. All right. Um, the, here's one from one of our refs trying to get some clarity. Are we to award a free kick or an or an uncontested scrum after the first collapse, or is it the referee's discretion? Referee, dis referee discretion, and, and remembering also, um, it's not a cop-out law. So referees still have to have due diligence around um, infringements at Scrum. So if a Scrum collapses and there's a genuine infringement there, then the reset is not the option. Um, it, could be a, it's, it, it'll, it could be a free kick or a penalty. Um, but under, under general management, of a, of a scrum, if there's no infringement early, then then they may choose to reset that. Cool. Thank you. But it, it can it can't become a pattern. Cool. So we've got some questions coming through around the rationale for various um, law trials. Um, tonight's around sort of getting some clarity um, around the laws that we're playing. So we won't um, delve into that area tonight. However, I would say this: the global law trials are trials. The experimental domestic uh, law safety law variations are experimental, um, and there are avenues for providing feedback uh, during and after the season on how you feel that those that those trials um, and experiments have gone. 
Um, is it legal wheeling of is, is legal wheeling of the scrum allowed? Yeah, so there's nothing in law that says you can't um, that a scrum can't turn. Um, the, the, so the things to be aware of there, yeah, generally most scrums will turn to some degree. Mm -hmm. um, what referees need to be looking out for are players in the front row who are not in a position to push forward. So essentially, they're either uh, the, they're almost pulling back. So that's a different body shape to a front row who's trying to stay in the fight and push forward. So, um, yep, scrums will wheel um, and they are entitled to wheel, but you can't turn them illegally by pulling back on one side. Thank you for that clarification, Matt. Uh, Zoomers, people beaming in, I'm not sure what we call people that are on webinars, um, but everyone, we've, we've passed our, our 60 minute mark. Um, and so we'll just start to, to wrap things up here. Um, Matt, Matt, final thoughts on, on what we've covered tonight and maybe where to go for further information. Thanks, Wayne. So, so a couple of final thoughts. Uh, I, I come back to that word opportunity, um, not only for our referees, but also for our coaches. Um, and I, I reckon it's a really exciting piece of work for everyone uh, to do things a little bit differently. And these laws, uh, when we look across them, um, there can be some incredible gain, not, not only for yourselves, but more importantly for our players, because that's what we're there for. There's two main reasons we've got the Global Law Trials and the EDSLVs. They'll either be because we're trying to enhance the shape of the game, or we're trying to enhance safety. Um, and those two reasons alone are two really good reasons to make sure that we all play our part um, with these laws, know them, apply them, coach them, and ultimately play them really well and get some, get some great gains out of it. Hey, thank you, Matt. Some great closing statements. Look, thank you, everybody, for Zooming in this evening. Um, I think tonight's shown um, the interest that we have in, in these uh, law variations um, and law trials. I encourage you to reach out to your provincial unions, to your uh, referee education officers, to your, to your referee associations, um, and that we work together, all parts of the community game, um, to make these a success. Remember, there is um, avenues to, giving, to give feedback um, for these laws this season. Um, I wish you all the best for the, for the season. I hope you have a, a fabs experience yourself. That's fun, achieving, belonging, and safe. Um, and that we do for our players. We create that for our players. Um, keep an eye out for info on upcoming webinars um, in the future. This is the second of a number that we'll be having. Thank you, Matt Peters, tonight for your experience and for getting Brendan and, uh, and Mike in. Um, so all the best um, to you. Um, remember, this is available on Rugby Toolbox. Um, so if you want to send that link out to, to others or you want to go over it again on what some of the, our panellists has um, shared with us tonight, we encourage you to do that. Um, all the best for the rest of the season. Stay well. Um, on behalf of myself, Matt, and everybody else here at the New Zealand rugby team, um, Kakite and good evening. Thanks, everyone.